Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today, Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to Collider Movie Talk. This is the best damn show in the entire galaxy, and I'm just feeling confident today. I have a feeling that this is going to be the best show that we've ever done. It's going to be a oh, top yeah. 10 oh, kind yeah. of show, and I'm not just saying that because Ashley is exquisitely dressed today. Thank you, sir. Um, before we meet the rest of the panel, <laughs> Ashley, it was your birthday yesterday. Yeah. Did you have a nice dinner eating raw, disgusting sushi? It was delicious. I cannot believe you don't like sushi. No. Mark is not human. I know. Really. Something's wrong not, with you, Mark. Something's wrong with you. I will, I will eat by myself at the Cheesecake Factory and enjoy every <laughs> second of it. Who's joining me on this cavalcade of cinematic news? here is Dennis Zen, who actually likes sushi. Yes, I do like sushi. Mm. I actually am filling in for Christian. Apparently, I, I, I found out why they actually gave me John's job after he <laughs> left was they wanted me to fill in every single role here. <laughs> <laughs> whenever needed. Also here, Josh Knapp. Yeah, he's filling in on my my chair over there, so don't complain about it. It's okay. We move that, chairs that's your around. Hero, that's your hero's chair. We move chairs around. Don't get weird about Musical it. Chairs. Eat some sushi. Don't stop being a baby about it. Hey, you Why? like sushi. Yeah, have some pizza. I haven't have had Sicilian a bad meal slice. in 15 years because I haven't had raw fish. Sushi on pizza. Get some 16. of that albacore tuna. We're going to swap. We're going to switch Mark Ellis's whole world around. We're, we're switching chairs. We're switching we're diets. Switching chairs. It's crazy on here. And I'm about to throw another curveball at you. We have some breaking news before we get into the rundown story. It was just shown that we have a poster for X-Men Apocalypse. It's brand new. I know Schnepp wasn't a huge fan of the posters we ran yesterday, so now we're going to check out this X-Men one and see how it feels for his new chair. We also are going to show you guys some new Civil War posters, which I don't think Schnepp's going to dig too much. And we have the official running time for Captain America Civil War. Is it the longest movie ever? You're going to find out. I guess we'll just tell you right now. It clocks in at 2 hours and 20 seven minutes that is breaking the all-time marvel cinematic universe record which was age of ultron at two hours and 21 minutes schnapp is that the right play for captain america civil war being the longest running movie i think it's fantastic i mean what is it uh, i think uh, batman v superman clocked in at like 231 or something like that yeah it's gonna be over and so this and is just a few minutes sh shy of that and you know that the way marvel does their stuff they do the secret endings so they're gonna have at least two <laughs> extra credit secret endings so that's pretty awesome <laughs> yeah. you're already i'm already counting on it but the, those secret endings better at least be a minute and a half oh and it's it, it's gonna be ridiculous yeah. but it does give them a lot of time look you're setting up uh the you know your infinity you're, war infinity war so that's part one and two on its own and you need a lot of time to set up a huge intergalactic story like that plus two hours and 30 minutes is enough time for them to kill cap and then bring him back and then maybe kill him again all in the span of one movie so there's a lot of time for superheroes to die to get mad at each other and to patch things up dennis do you like this running time uh, i do i despite all the protests of the screenwriters saying it's not avengers 2.5 or whatever i still I still believe if you're going to have that many characters, you know, a lot of the stuff is coming off of what we already saw in Age of Ultron. I, I, I do feel like it, obviously it's going to be Captain America, it's going to be Iron Man, but we're going to get a Avengers type feel to it. And the length makes sense because they're going to cover so much ground and they need to set up the future movies as well. That's right. It's six more minutes that they have to eat shawarma in peace <laughs> after getting in a huge battle. Do we yeah. have the X-Men posters queued up, gentlemen? Are we ready to see them? Holy Whoa. God, that is the brand new poster for X-Men Apocalypse. It just hit the airwaves this morning. We found out about it, as we usually do at Collider.com. And look at Magneto, front yeah. and center. And then, obviously, standing behind him is the huge No Kids. That is no longer the bad guy from Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. That is Apocalypse yeah. in all of his glory. Dennis, I know that you're a huge fan of the source material, but you didn't love that Apocalypse trailer that they showed at Comic-Con. No. How do you feel about this poster? Yeah, I, I like, I, despite some people's protests and arguing with me online about how they haven't changed him all, he looks a lot different than he did back at, at, at Comic-Con when they showed that trailer where where they, they hadn't enhanced him. Um, the colors, the, the facial, like if you look at that poster now, you can see that that looks a lot more like the comic mm -hmm. book version of Apocalypse versus before where he, yeah, he looked like uh, Mr. Freeze slash Ivan Ooze or whatever the hell else. Um, we get a nice clear shot of uh, Archangel in there as well, which I think is pretty cool. But look, I mean, look, look, we saw that thing at Comic-Con and they said, look, we're doing you guys a favor by showing you this footage that early. So was it fair for us to penalize? Do you think that this is the way that they always intended Apocalypse to look? Or do you think they took all that fan criticism and said, guys, we have to change the look a little bit? Well, it's one of two things. It's either they, they took the fan criticism criticism and they adjusted to it 
or they were very, very naive because when they released the, that footage at Comic-Con, they were saying, oh, we, we, we know that the, the audience will realize this is an early rendition <laughs> and that they will be very forgiving. We know they'll put what? down their cell phones and what? not try to get any footage. What? Right. What? Have they happen. been to Comic-Con before? <laughs> like, right. how, how, how could you think that? So it's one or two things, one or the other. Schnapp, you are the box office oracle. You have also recently been the poster hater. How do you feel <laughs> about the apocalypse? You know what? One? I got to say, I like this poster. I mean, you know, I criticize a lot about when it's just a Photoshop job. And obviously this is a Photoshop job, but it's really well done. I think it, it's very well uh, organized. Let's say it reminds me of like if you turn it into stained glass, it could be in somebody's church. I mean, the way it's <laughs> the way it's designed, it's very it's if it has that kind of like biblical power to it. You have the giant apocalypse and the angel and the, it's a four horsemen. It's it's really well laid out. I think the design of it's great. I'm sure we're going to see another poster eventually, but this one right now has my interest. So I think it's a good poster. Yeah, I mean, look, I look at this thing and I'm like, okay, so you see Archangel, you're right. You also get to see Storm and Psylocke on the side, so it looks like they're going to have a pretty big role in this, too. Is this just going to be the first of many posters that we get? Because it, you're not teasing a lot of the characters here. I mean, Well, this is basically the, who's going to be the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Yeah. They got the apocalypse right, up there and right. they got his four, four horsemen. I'm sure there's going to be an alternate poster that has you know the good guys on that's there. right so it's in in summation i think this is the right poster to kind of usher in this new generation of x-men if you will he's advertising this new movie seeing that this is what we're going up against it looks pretty formidable yeah okay so that's our breaking news and now we finally get to go to the ad, the, the rundown for ashley mova oscar winner jk simmons who perfectly portrayed peter parker's loudmouth boss j jonah jameson in sam raimi's three spider-man films has jumped marvel's ship over to dc excuse me according to a report from the hollywood reporter simmons will play gotham city police commissioner james gordon in justice league following in the footsteps of gary oldman who played the character in christopher nolan the Dark Knight trilogy. No further details on Simmons' character were revealed. Justice League Part 1 begins filming this April 11th. Mark, what do you think of J.K. Simmons as Commissioner Gordon? Well, I hope that I get that many <laughs> chuckles from his take on Commissioner Gordon because, look, he was great as J. Jonah Jameson. This is a very different role, and it speaks to his range as an actor that they want him as Commissioner Gordon in what, by all means, seems to be a more serious take on a comic book franchise than those Raimi Spider-Man movies were. J.K. Simmons He's an Oscar-winning actor. We love him in a variety of things. So I have no doubt in my mind that he can pull this off. When that guy is in a movie, it doesn't matter what the stature or what the scope of the film is. He is a credit to the movie. He improves every set that he's on. So the fact that you have him in a movie like this, with all these whispers that we're hearing about, oh, I don't know, the studio's a little nervous about Batman versus Superman. What is this spell for the Justice League? This might be able to put at least a Band-Aid on that, saying, no, we have a lot of confidence in where we're going with this, and this casting just proves that. Schnepp. Do you like this? I absolutely love this casting. I, you know, the Commissioner Gordon is now J. Jonah Jameson. Doesn't matter to me. It's it's actually <laughs> J.K. Simmons, who's an incredible actor. All the way from Oz, everything he's ever been in is fantastic. He's got such range. He's got such power. I can't wait to see what he brings to commission the 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 character of Commissioner Gordon, what kind of take is he going to have on it? How does he fit into Just League? Why do they not have him in Batman v Superman? My guess is that Commissioner Gordon's retired. That's my guess, and that maybe Bruce Wayne brings him out of retirement to help run the Just League. That would be kind of interesting. So I don't know what how they're going to integrate Commissioner Gordon into this new DC universe, but it's a good start by getting such an amazing actor. That's right. Know? Now, Dennis, we have seen him as J. Jonah Jameson, where it's a very comical kind of role. We've seen him very serious and menacing in something like Whiplash, and we also have seen kind of a, a serious take, but also having a sense of humor in Terminator Genesis, which he was the best part of that train right. wreck. So where do you think the comedic tone that he is able to bring to a role is going to fall in Justice League, if at all? Uh, I don't think it will. I think it's, it's going to be more of a dramatic and serious role. I was quite, not so, totally shocked, but I was surprised when, when I heard there was news about J.K. Simmons. The first thing I thought was, oh, they've recast, they recast him as J. J. Jonah Jameson yeah, right. in the new Spider-Man movie. And then I looked, I was like, oh, Commissioner Gordon, that's that's a different. Not that it's a bad thing. I think he's a wonderful actor, and what we've seen, his range is so great between you know all the stuff you know, he also played uh, Juno's dad in uh, totally. Juno mm -hmm. like we've yes. seen him play a wide variety of characters so I think he he will be able to knock this out of the park we, we had just always been speculating oh is Brian Cranston gonna play this role Brian Cranston and then now J.K. Simmons comes out of nowhere I mean I guess this kind of says it 
th- he's not coming back for Spider-Man. They're not casting him as no. as as this and then putting him in in Spider-Man. Yeah, I mean, are we bummed that this does sound the death knell for any of those hopes that he was going to come back as J. Jonah Jameson? I would have loved to have seen it. It's not going to break my heart. We were even talking about Ice Cube maybe yeah. stepping in there. No, and that's we, not we were a bad joking idea. about it last week, and then I saw in the trade somebody's like, Ice Cube is up for J. Jonah Jameson. <laughs> I was like, Hell yeah, bring on Ice Cube. We are influencing policy. Totally. Thanks here for watching movie the talk. show. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley, what's next? Not a lot is known about the upcoming Marvel slash Sony produced Spider-Man reboot other than the casting of Tom Holland as the web slinger, Marissa Tomei as his Aunt May, with cop car director John Watts directing. Now Deadline is reporting that Disney Channel actress and singer Zendaya has landed a key role after quietly testing for the part with a number of young actresses. Her character's name, Michelle, is the only detail released thus far, with fans wondering if it's red herring and she is actually cast as a well-known known character from Spider-Man's source material. The rebooted Spider-Man film will open in theaters July 7, 2017. Schnepp, what do you think of the Zendaya casting in the Spider-Man standalone? I'm into it. I don't know what she's done on Disney, the kids' channels or whatever, but it's weird when you have somebody who has a cooler name than the character they're cast for. Like, I would have been more into it if it was a, Zendaya is cast in the new Spider-Man movie as Zendaya. Because I was like, wow, what, what kind of very interesting, weird name? Who is Zendaya in playing Zendaya? But, you know, Michelle, it's from what I know, it's like, you know, in the comic book, she's like Spider-Man's roommate. So maybe they're going that way and they're going to, you know, kind of ixnay. Gwen Stacy and Mary Jane and let, and let just let Spider-Man be a high school student. I'm sure they'll have Gwen Stacy in there. I'm sure they'll have Flash Thompson in there. A lot of the other high school people are in the in the comic book series. But let's see let's see how they play it out. I, I like this casting. Yeah, I mean, how many love interests can a dude possibly have who's kind of a you know an outcast in high school? He's already got the Gwen Stacy angle. He's already got the Mary Jane. So you know, you, I, I don't know if he's going to take this on as romantically. I don't know that it needs to be that. It could just be somebody that he's just kind of smitten with. Or you're right, maybe they're just roomies and that they, they just happen to be together. But it, the casting definitely signals to me that they're not only doing this as a younger high schooler kind of Peter Parker, the ones that we maybe got to see early on in the Raimi and the Amazing Spider-Man franchises, but also that they're going after a younger demographic with this film, too. They're going to try to hook you while you're young, a lot like golf or crack. You get them while they're young, and that's how you get really good at something. So, Dennis, I know you're a huge Zendaya fan. I know you cannot stop listening to her around the office. Are you excited she's going to be in the new Spider-Man uh, Well, franchise? speaking of... I'm assuming they're going to be in college. If she's going to be her, his roommate, like it's, it's not like he's going to room up with her and turn high school. Can you room with a girl in college? I would have loved to have done that when I was a freshman. That was illegal, man. I, I don't know, but uh, as far as her casting, I, I don't know because I haven't really seen her much. I, I saw like 10 minutes of that show she's in on Disney, Shake It Up, but I can't really judge someone on, on their performance in a Disney show because they teach all those actors and actresses to act the same way, which is kind of this very loud, over-the-top theatrical <laughs> style, right? The interesting thing about her is that she was the runner-up to play Storm in X-Men Apocalypse. Wow. And that ev- eventually went to Alexander Ship. Ship, who actually took over for Zendaya. <laughs> Zendaya was cast as Aaliyah in the TV movie, and she dropped out, and Alexander Ship took over that wow. job. Wow. So, these girls are battling. So, so yeah, research. apparently these two are very familiar with each other and probably see each other a lot in, in the audition room. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm wait and see approach. I, I don't think it's a red herring because fans have pointed out, I, I'm not familiar with this Michelle Gonzalez character, but apparently she's in there as a love interest. So uh, maybe it's not Mary Jane. At first I thought maybe it is uh, they're hiding Mary Jane or Gwen Stacy, but now I think it's going to be this Michelle Gonzalez character. Right, and obviously, I mean, th- this I, this doesn't really move the needle for me that much either way. I'm not like, oh, now Zendaya's in it. This is a legitimate project all of a sudden. But I'm also not going to be like, you got a Disney Channel actress to be this Michelle? Like, oh, no, this movie's ruined. Like, it's it's fine. You're going after a demographic. She's a popular actress. She's up and coming. Cast her in a movie. We'll see what happens. Ashley, what do we got next? We're going on into buy or sell. Ooh, buy or sell is that that lovable segment of the show where Ashley's going to give us a topic, right? And then we here are going to give her hard-earned cash money yes. if we like the topic. And if not, we actually get to take Ashley's money. So no, it's going to be a fun part of the little rules. game here today. All right. Though Deadpool finally gave up the number one spot at the box office this weekend, that doesn't stop it from smashing another record in the books. This past weekend's numbers were good enough to make it the third R-rated film ever to cross the 
the 300 million mark in domestic box office. Only The Passion of the Christ and American Sniper hold the number one and number two spot respectively. Deadpool has also nabbed the number three spot of the highest grossing origin movies in the superhero genre. Dennis, buyers sell Deadpool as the third highest grossing R-rated movie of all time. Well, I'm going to buy it. I mean, if you had told me this a year ago, I would have been, I, I would call you a liar. Uh, uh, but of course, only John Schnepp is the one who predicted uh, the, the box what, office what success. What can I say? What can I say? Um, but it just shows you that uh, a very entertaining movie, along with a brilliant marketing campaign, can take even something that's R rated and, and get big dollars at the box office. I mean, look, if we, like, like, let's say in a few weeks that we were all on the, the movie trivia schmodown right here in Collider, right? And we're like, what is the number one R rated movie of all time as far as gross? I think we'd all probably say, like, uh, uh, The Hangover, something like that, because you think of opening weekend right. when you think of all time domestic box office. But look at American Sniper, look at The Passion of the Christ. Those are movies that, yes, they had big openings and a lot. Of buzz around them, but they just kept performing week to week to week, and that's the same thing that Deadpool did. So when Deadpool opened to 135 million dollars, it's like, okay, that's a great opening. Let's see what it does in the following subsequent weeks, and it managed to just keep on raking in the cash. It was not a one-week wonder, so I'm not surprised that it has done this kind of business. And obviously, everybody at Fox is, you know, over the moon about it. Snap, do you think that it deserves to be number three? And do you think that this signals, like what we talked about a couple weeks ago, are we going to get more? R-rated comic book movies because of this news. I think so. I think it opens up the genre of a lot of R-rated anything, not just comic book movies, but makes people feel a little more relaxed about going a little bit further, making things a little more adult. As long as they they target that audience and market it the right way, I think they're going to get those numbers. They make a good film if it's R-rated, and they make it so that everything that's in the trailer is even better when you see the film, which is what Deadpool is. Then it's a no-lose situation. I, I'm very happy that it's number three. I think it'll keep climbing, though. I'm sure it'll get to number two quite easily in the next two weeks, maybe even number one. So, I mean, I'm happy with it, so I buy it. Yeah. Deadpool passing Jesus? What? Well, <laughs> when either of you guys gotten that trivia question right. Did you know that Passion of the Christ, first of all, I forgot that Passion of the Christ was R-rated at all. Right. And American Sniper, it went on such a crazy run, and then we just all kind of forgot yeah. about it after that Oscars. So the fact that that's still the number one R-rated movie, I wonder if if, Dead, if this Deadpool doesn't have a shot, maybe Deadpool 2 can beat it at some Sure, point. well, you know what I mean? I would have got it wrong, but now I know. All right, well, you know, uh, speaking of, I, I mean, this thing, I don't know how to translate into Hardcore Henry, so let's just have Ashley do <laughs> All right, it. SGX Entertainment has unveiled a new trailer for their first-person action movie, Hardcore Henry. The film, which is written and directed by Elia Neyshuler, is shot entirely in the first-person point of view, giving you, the audience member, a unique perspective during the film. Hardcore Henry finds Henry being brought back to life by his dead wife, played by Haley Bennett, with zero memories and a new cyborg body. Shortly thereafter, his wife is kidnapped by a telekinetic megalomaniac, and Henry must battle an army of mercenaries to get her back. Hardcore Henry opens in theaters on April 8th. Mark Byers saw this new trailer for Hardcore Henry. Uh, I'm gonna buy it just based on the novelty of what I saw. I don't know that I can sit through this. I really don't know that I want to sit through a movie that is a feature film that has this kind of shot for the entire movie. But I will say, look, I like the premise. It's a different spin on like a RoboCop kind of thing. You bring him back to life. He's just this superhero that can kick ass. If you're a megalomaniac out there and you're gonna kidnap somebody, maybe don't hijack the wife of a huge super mutant that just came back to life and is going to kill everybody. That's not the right play to make, but I'm glad he did it because now we get this new interesting take on what could be a really neat action premise. Again, I saw the trailer and I'm like, this is very impressive how they did that. It gives me a headache thinking about the production that went into this and getting that shot right all the time, but I just don't know if me as an audience member can sit through it for 90 minutes. I hope this running time isn't like Captain America Civil War. I hope this is like a tight 88 <laughs> minutes and we get in, we get out before I puke. Dennis, A, are you going to puke watching this movie? Then B, do you buy or sell it? Uh, that I I would puke at the movie theater <laughs> watching this. Uh, that's why I, I I buy the trailer, but I sell that I'm gonna actually see it in the theater. Right. I'm gonna wait till it comes out on home video and and, t and watch it on a television screen. Because 90 minutes of this, I'm gonna get sick and I'm gonna throw up. Uh, the action looks cool. It looks interesting. It looks more like something that I would see on YouTube actually, like a like a web series or right. something like that. So can can this movie hold my interest for 90 minutes? I don't know. 
I'm not finding out in the theater because I will have to take a barf bag with me. Schnepp, you're our boy here. Um, you like a lot of crazy stuff. You like a lot yeah. of cult favorites. You like to go off the grid sometimes and just hole up and watch weird movies. Yeah. Is this going to be one of them? I'm going off the grid, yo. I cannot wait. buy this so wholeheartedly. <laughs> I, can't, I could watch a four-hour movie of this. I've been waiting for a movie like this to actually pop off and see if I can handle it because it does look crazy, but I'm, I am I like watching those weird Russians like Ginger run ar across like you know the top of like weird buildings and hang off stuff. They're like, these people are nuts and it's all shot with a GoPro. I love GoPro. Like when I'm on a plane, I'm watching the GoPro channel. Just watch people do crazy mad you shit. You watch this stuff on a plane? Yeah. I, wow. I, I don't, and I don't get seasick and I don't get motion sick. So I'm like, I cannot wait to see it, how far this film goes. Whether it'll be fun or not, I think seeing, this is I think the third trailer they, they released. They released one about a year ago when it was still called Hardcore. But I think they realized they might want to change the yeah. title when you do a Google search. <laughs> yeah. Like, yo, Chuck Henry on that shit, son. Chuck something on that because we're, get, we're getting way too much. Hey, come on, you know. It's like, uh, you know is that why they sell him the name Henry? Like Hardcore uh, oh, Frank, yeah. you go to yeah. a website. Hardcore totally. Dave, you go to a no, website. Add that name on on there so yeah they had to slap a name on there but you know it looks really exciting to me it's so visceral i cannot i really cannot wait to see the film in a theater i i do i hear i see what you're saying but i'm going to take the pepsi challenge man i cannot wait but you got to think that like look the job of a trailer is to sell the movie and i love when trailers sell a movie honestly they don't like uh, like the village i didn't feel like i got sold what the movie was going to be mm. this i know what the movie's going to be but did the trailer do a job of hooking a mass audience i know that not every movie is meant for a mass audience but don't you think that a lot of people are going to see this trailer and just be more like dennis where it's like look i'll wait till this thing comes out on demand or something like that because i can't handle it in the theater you know what i don't know i mean honestly i think you get jacked up drink a lot of coffee or do whatever you got to do before you go see a movie and get into this that's what i'm 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 looking for an experience when i see this movie just want a bunch of bros crushing monster energy drink dry, something like their that hummers. i want people screaming in the theater like yo like you know what i was saying like when you have an action film and people are into it and everyone in the theater is on that same vibe and people are clapping and laughing and cheering that's a kind of a, like a group experience. You don't want people talking behind you. And we talked about that yesterday on the show, like yeah. the rudeness factor. But the opposite of that is when you go see an action film or a comedy and everyone's laughing and enjoying it, that's when you feel really good about being in a movie theater. And that's what I'm hoping to have that experience with this film is everyone is just like, what? Like freaking out when he's jumping off stuff. And like, cause a lot of those, all these, uh, these special effects it's, it, there's a lot of special effects in the film doing jump cuts and stuff but a lot of the, the stunts are all real so i'm really excited to see how they merge all that stuff and that's what know? impressed me about watching the trailers it, it does look like like you would think making a movie like this they want to do it on a shoestring budget and that may well be the case but seeing the production values here it looked like they really put a lot of effort and money mm -hmm. into making this thing right yeah yeah and also the timing you know, i wonder how long each take obviously it's not going to be a complete run through where right. it's like from minute one all the way to the end it's all continuous so where where are, they, where are they going to do those cuts and, right. and how long each take is going to be because setting up all those different like stunts and action you know that that's a lot of work especially the longer the take goes yeah, yeah. especially when you're also like running along little cliff edges you got the parkour masters jumping around all spider like you know some people broke bones on this i'm sure about it oh so. that's right man well just remember that i bought the trailer not necessarily the <laughs> movie yet ashley how is loki gonna look maybe in a tux well current bond star daniel craig has been pretty vocal about continuing on as the iconic british spy making it clear that if he did return, it would only be for the money. Though he's contracted to return for Bond 25, that hasn't stopped the British bookies from naming a few frontrunners to replace him. Idris Elba, Tom Hardy, and Michael Fassbender have all been mentioned in the past, but now we have a new name to add to the list. THR reports that the bookies have changed up their order, adding Tom Hiddleston to the top of the list alongside other rumored Bond favorite Idris Elba. Hiddleston's turn as a secret agent in the BBC series, The Night Manager, is credited for the move. Schnett by or sell Tom Hiddleston as James Bond. You know, it was a weird call, but, you know, I'm going to buy what these British bookies are booking, you know? <laughs> like, oh, you might get on, get on Hiddleston. And it's like, where do these British bookies get Hiddleston? It's because he was in some kind of a secret agent, something that they only aired over there so far. So we haven't seen that. We all think of him as Loki. He's also an incredible theater, theatrical actor. He can memorize entire plays and just spot him off verbatim. The man's an incredible actor. Can he play James Bond? I think so. I think he's right in there with Idris Elba. I'd like to see either one of those take over for Craig. I don't care really to see Craig return, honestly. I think he did a good job as James Bond. I love Casino Royale as they continue to go forward.
I think it got tired and his thuggish portrayal of James Bond also got tired for me. I don't want it to go back to the Piers Brosnan, Roger Moore, like goofy, like, you know, kind of jokey wink, wink Bond. I do. I still like a serious Bond, but I think Hiddleston can play it. And so I'm, I'm buying it. Yeah, I would buy it as well. I mean, I think that the Daniel Craig Bonds have served their purpose and, yeah. and that it got Bond back into the mainstream. It got away from that like jokey, fairly spoof like movie towards the end of Piers Brosnan's mm -hmm. run. And so when we saw Casino Royale, we're like, oh, this is a different Bond and he's back. It does feel like, and I might not have said this before I saw Spectre, but now it just feels like everybody is just kind of licking the stamp and mailing it in. And it's like, if you want to reinvigorate a franchise, you get somebody new to step into the lead. I think Hiddleston would be a great kind of mix of what you're talking about, where you have the, the debonair like a Roger Moore mixed with the rough and tumble Daniel Craig version, where Hiddleston can do both those things mm -hmm. very, very well. Does he have the time? Because he's still going to be Loki, I guess, for the foreseeable future. But if Loki is going to start to be phased out of the Marvel Cinematic right. Universe, then it would be nice for an actor to have a new tentpole franchise to do when he's not doing more independent projects, which we also know Hiddleston wants to accomplish. The British bookie situation, that thing is off the charts crazy. Right. I know you were in London recently. Like, yeah. It's just you can gamble on anything at any time in London. Is that right? That's true. You go to Lambrokes and you just like throw a bet on, like, is that old lady going to make it across the street? Hey, I don't know. I'm putting 20 <laughs> 20 quid on it, yo. Uh, she, she just got hit by a car. She didn't look. I uh, won that money, mate. So, yeah, you can gamble. The, the, the people in London love to gamble. I mean, they have like everything's whited out. The windows are whited out. So you can't really have to actually go inside and you see a lot of weird sweating people against, you know, betting. Um, Lambrokes, check it out if you want to be a winner. So, yeah, I mean, I, that's where the British bookies maybe got this whole, like, you know, now they're betting on Bond. They got to bet on everything. So, Dennis, we know you love going to Vegas. Will you be flying to Lambrooks and will you be putting money on Tom Hiddleston? Uh, I don't know if I'll put money on it, but I, I do like the choice. I buy it. Uh, any of the, the names they mentioned before, I think, would be a great Bond. And for him, he definitely has that suave factor that you need for, for Bond. I mean, it's funny. We, as, you know, as fanboys, love him because he plays Loki and he plays it well. He's one of the best villains in the Marvel Universe fangirls love him mm -hmm. like uh, I've covered the Avengers red carpet before and uh, the Thor the Dark World and yeah, obviously Chris Hemsworth comes out he's Thor girls love him they're cheering for him Tom Hiddleston comes out they cheer even louder for him. <laughs> right. It's crazy. And I, I think he can fit, fit this role very well. Ashley, we, we know that Jared Leto is always going to be number one in your heart. But okay. imagine Tom Hiddleston yeah. in a talks to James Bond. Because he's a badass. You know, that's why girls, you know, want to cheer for him because he's a badass. I could totally see this. I think that that's a nice fit. I like it. I'm into it. Snap, anything else you want to bet on? Uh, on the next question. <laughs> All right. If you say so. 20th Century Fox's The Predator movie has the fans buzzing ever since director Shane Black unveiled a promo poster for the movie, with Fox dating the movie for March 2nd, 2018. Since this is a sequel to the original movie, many have wondered if Arnold Schwarzenegger would ever return for the movie. Speaking with the Arnold fans website, Schwarzenegger revealed that he has a lunch meeting set with Shane Black, where the two will presumably discuss a possible role in the upcoming movie. The Predator is written by the the Monster Squad's Fred Decker with Shane Black, who will also direct. Dennis Byers sell Arnold reprising his role as Dutch for The Predator. I'm going to buy it, and I'd like to see him come back. Uh, I don't necessarily want to see him as the main character in this movie, but if like they send a group of, uh, of guys, soldiers, into the, the jungle, and they, I mentioned this on a previous movie talk, and they run into him. He's been, like, living there, surviving there, maybe <laughs> trying to fight the predator this this whole time, and he he gives them advice and tips on how to hunt this thing. Like, something like that. I, yeah, but I wouldn't want him as the main guy in it. Schnapp? Yeah, I'm going to sell it. I, You know, I want, I agree, I, I would like to see him show up, but I'm going to Dutch oven those writers. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Don't be bringing Arnold back in every Yikes. single thing that guy's ever been in. I'd like to see Arnold just do something brand new. He's a fun actor. The only thing I really want to see him, like, the return to is Conan and do that, rock that Conan, whatever the Conan, King Conan, rock that, be in that chair, like, thinking about stuff and, what, I must fight? You know, I can't even do a good Arnold. But, yeah, but I mean, look, with the, the issue with Arnold doing new things is that he has tried that. He tried to be a sheriff in a town just above the border. He tried to break out of prison with Sylvester Stallone, and while those movies may have been dumb fun, they didn't make any money at the box right. office, so you're looking for that punch. You still want to maintain some sort of A-list clout status when it comes to being able to open a movie, and having Arnold by himself doesn't seem to be doing the trick anymore, so if you throw Arnold and Predator on a poster together, that might be able to be the thing that gets him back to A-list, at least for a little bit. I'm going to buy this because I'd love to see it. I always 
said that I really like that Predators movie. I know a lot of people are divided on it, but I did think that it would have been great if you shoehorn Schwarzenegger into that movie somehow. Mm -hmm. If you can't do that one, you get him into this new one. And you're right, Dennis. It's some sort of advisory role. He doesn't even necessarily need to be in the jungle battling with Predator. Mm -hmm. He can just be like he got rescued and then he's giving them tips on how to get in there and then he's done. He's done. It's nice to see Arnold back, and now let's follow this new crew. I would buy that if it was a cameo, like in the city, somewhere there, like, we've got someone who's encountered this creature before, and then Arnold's like, gentleman, or comes, shows up. <laughs> I'm doing a Sly Stallone, gentleman, I'm, I'm, I'm Arnold. You know, it would be funny, he like, just like, shows up and tells him how to do what it. What kind of tips do you give somebody fighting a predator? It's like, just get rid of your guns, cover yourself in mud, and use a log. Like, yeah. that's how I defeated right. this thing. Run away from a semi-nuclear bomb. <laughs> and I'll also say this, look, Arnold Schwarzenegger, he's a huge dude, he's jacked. When you, how do you, how do you get jacked? You got to work out. But you also have to eat a lot. You have to get a lot of protein. Right. In order to do that, you have to have a lot of lunches with a lot of different people. Okay, so Arnold Schwarzenegger having lunch with Shane Black doesn't automatically confirm that he's going to even talk about the notion of Predator in there. Arnold Schwarzenegger's had lunch with Tom Arnold and James Cameron a bunch. There's no true lies too that's coming down the pipe right. anytime soon. So don't get just don't get crazy just yet about Arnold definitely being in Predator. Wait, let's see how the lunch goes. See who pays the bill, and then we'll move going forward on whether he's actually going to be in Predator. I think it'd be pretty cool to see that. I think you know, I'm going to reverse my sell. I'll buy it if he's in as, as a cameo mm -hmm. and they don't even make a big deal about it and you, he just shows up while you're watching the movie like what? Like in the last like third of the film he shows up and gets killed by the Predator, but he still imparts enough knowledge that the rest of the team can kill this new Predator. Well, look, either way, on March 2nd, 2018, we get to see the movie, and hopefully that week on Movie Talk, we will be doing this next segment for the new Predator film. It is opening this week, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. For all the latest Showtime and ticket information, just go to amctheaters.com. Ashley, what are we seeing this weekend? Well, this week, it's the Brothers Grimsby. Dimwitted Nobby, Sasha Barra Cohen, lives in an English fishing town with his loving girlfriend, Wubble Wilson and nine children. For the last 28 years, he's been searching for his long lost brother, Sebastian, Mark Strong. When the two finally reunite, Nobby finds out that his sibling is a top MI6 agent who's just uncovered a sinister plot. Wrongfully accused and on the run, Sebastian now realizes that he needs Nobby's help to save the world and prove his innocence. Um, I, I I just can't get into this movie from the trailer. Like we all talked about the last trailer here on Movie Talk that it looked like they were selling Sasha Baron Cohen's entire career, which has been hilarious so far. You have Ali G, mm -hmm. you have Borat, and then they're using that to sell us on this new movie that has nothing to do with either one of those characters. So it's like, hey, we made you laugh before. Trust us to do it again in this new spy movie with Mark Strong. I love the premises. Don't get me wrong. I think it's genius. I like these two playing off one another. I just don't think that it's going to work based on this, the material I've seen so far on the trailer. I don't mind when comedy trailers step back a little bit and don't show you the best jokes. I don't think that's been the case here. I think they've thrown everything at you and just nothing has really hit yet. Dennis, are you into seeing this? No, I mean, like you, I thought the trailers were very underwhelming. I mean, yeah, the premise sounds great, and I love Sasha Baron Cohen as well, you know, Borat and Ali G, but the trailers don't, don't do anything for me. A lot of the jokes we've seen in there are, are kind of recycled from other things we've seen before, right? right? The, the therapist one, yep. and the suck on the balls thing or yep. whatever. Like, I just, I, I'm trying to convince myself to go see it, but right now, I think on Rotten Tomatoes, it's like 43% or something like that, so I, I just don't know. Well, I don't need to convince myself. I will be seeing it tomorrow okay. afternoon. Christian and I are going. We'll report back to base camp. Schnapp, are you going to be going with us? No. Um, <laughs> uh, based on the horrible trailer, I'm going to skip it. Uh, look, I loved Borat. I loved Ali G. But don't forget Bruno and the Dictator. So those are the things that have kept, you know, and that, this feels like a lesser degree to that kind of really bad humor, kind of jokes that don't stick. Honestly, after seeing that horrible trailer, I was like, man, maybe it's going to be really funny. Like, it's almost like the trailer, like, you know, I got like Stockholm syndrome from the trailer. Like, I now I must see the movie because it's going to be that bad. I, I, it's hard to tell. It was just, a, just a, a badly put together trailer, which was like, wow, that just really looks unfunny and kind of like an ugly comedy. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't I didn't have a lot of desire to see Get Smart when they released that. There was Steve Carell and Anne Hathaway and ended up enjoying that movie for what it was. Same thing with Spy with Melissa McCarthy. I'm like, I don't know if this is if they're going to try to, you know, do the comedy too hard in this. And right. I ended up enjoying that one as well. So maybe it's going to be the same situation. I just don't think that this movie looks like it can even live up to those films. So I'm going to have to, uh, well, actually, I do You're going to see it, it tomorrow. Yeah, you can't pass. Yeah. <laughs> 
I'm yeah, looking has. forward to hearing what you have to say because honestly, what if you're like, oh my God, it's really funny and the trailer just was horribly cut together. They, they tried to pick all these scenes that they thought would work in the trailer, but instead you actually have to see them in context. That happens a lot with trailers. Can we ever just talk about something that's not movies? I Does think it always so. have to be movies with Well, us? maybe after the movie talk show, we'll talk about other things. Talk about sushi, okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> don't talk about sushi. Now it's time for mailbag, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. How do one of you, our loyal viewers, get your question on? It's simple. Just email us collidervideo at gmail.com. We always pick out a few mailbag questions. And we want to remind you guys, at the end of this show, we're going to be taking some live Twitter queries. So make sure you go ahead and hit up Ashley right now at Collider Video. She's the gatekeeper, so be very nice to her and tell her how nice she looks in that Schmoes No Shirt Thank that you. she probably got from Christian because I, I didn't did. get it for you. So. <laughs> What's first up in the mailbag? All right, Christopher Wemhoff writes, Hey, crew, love your shows. They are a cornerstone of my daily routine for going on two months. I have been thinking about what other movies make sense as an R-rated film that could have a similar kind of unique, not necessarily similar story that justifies an R rating instead of PG-13. Do you think Lobo could be the DC competition as a single character film? Also, do you think collaborations with entities like Predator or Aliens could join the DC Cinematic Universe? If Predator is considered, could this blend in Dutch and the DC Universe? Sorry if two questions is garbage. P.S. Leave Natasha alone with E.T. That criminal was glorified for stealing candy from children. <laughs> <laughs> Triple question. Yeah. Triple, Triple weirdo. Uh, <laughs> I want to defer to the host of the great, a, uh, the great AMC show, the great Collider show, Hero Schnepp. What do you think about Lobo possibly being in a film as an R-rated character? And if so, is that going to be their answer to Deadpool? Christopher, that should have been your only question because that's a really <laughs> We'll insane. get to part two later. They're part two and three and X and seven later. But your part one question is the one we'll, I will address. Lobo being an R-rated film. Lobo was one of those hits that came out, like I think in the 90s, uh, Simon Bisley, Bisley, however you say his last name, amazing artist. Just, he killed that, he was like, he made that uh, comic book. Yeah, that, that's the artwork right there. Fantastic art. Guns. Yeah, and he's just like this insane assassin mercenary in outer space, ultra violent, and it was very satisfying, a very fun comic. It definitely felt like a heavy metal comic book. Um, I would wanna see that, that's what I would wanna see as an adaptation feature film live action. So in my mind, yes, it should be a, a very hard PG-13, if not R. And if DC doesn't want to go R, then they're gonna have to go hard PG-13 or throw it into the new line world or whatever if they can't have it part of their like, I don't mind Lobo not being part of the superhero universe. He doesn't have to be. They maybe should put Lobo into the new line world where they chuck Sandman and, and make it a one-off or make it a, a, just a separate entity and make it R-rated. I think that would be fantastic. Yeah, a one-off Lobo movie to me seems to make more sense than something like the one-off Venom movie they're talking about making where we so totally. associate Venom with Spider-Man or Carnage or other characters in that world. Lobo can, I think he could be not only an answer to Deadpool, but also to Guardians of the Galaxy. I mean, the yep. dude's an alien. He's an interstellar mercenary. Look at that guy. He looks like the guy from Sinister if he got his act together, got to the gym, and stopped hanging out with kids all the time. <laughs> he looks like somebody who could be cracking. Now, there could be some one-liners in there. Could totally. be a lot of hardcore action. You don't have to make it on a huge budget. I know there's going to be outer space scenes. You can work around that. If you're just working with Lobo and you're not trying to incorporate him into everything else, Dennis, I kind of like at least part one of this mailbag question. Are you on board with Lobo? Oh, totally. Uh, the, the funny thing about Lobo is he's created kind of to poke fun at those anti-heroes, totally. Wolverine yep. and Punisher, mm -hmm. but he kind of ended up being the poster boy for the ultra-violent, and he does kind of have a, a comical sense to him. So I would like to... I've already w warned about, like, let's not make every movie rated R, let's not make every superhero comic, but this is one that actually warrants it yeah. with the violence and, and the comedy. I could still, if they hadn't cast uh, Jason Momoa as Aquaman already, right. I could see him play Oh, uh, he would have killed it, yeah. yeah. That's right, now, Christopher, I want to warn you because you sound like a really smart guy and you're probably going to be in pitch meetings at major studios very soon in your life, so when you have a great pitch like Lobo, just close the briefcase and get the <laughs> hell out of the room before you start throwing. We should put yeah. Dutch, the aging Arnold Schwarzenegger character, into the DC universe. Shep, are you going to play the Dutch oven card yet again? Yes, I am. Chris, I'm Dutch ovening you on this weird, bizarre, freakish question. I don't know what you're eating, what kind of brownies you had. Like Dutch in the DC universe, predators fighting uh, the X-Men. It's just not, it'll never happen, ever, ever. 
<laughs> let, 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 let's just break this down, though, okay? Lobo is a guy that he, look, he's going to be on a lot of adventures in outer space, right? Yeah. So it's conceivable he could come across either a xenomorph <laughs> or a predator, right? Sure. And then if you are Lobo, yeah. and like what we were talking about with a predator film, Dennis, is that if you come across particularly a predator, and you're like, oh, how do I fight this thing? I'm not going to ask Lawrence Fishburne for advice. I'm not going to ask Gary Busey or Danny Glover for advice. I'm going to ask Arnold Schwarzenegger. That's how Dutch can blast off in his spaceship and come help Lobo. Am I way off base here? Uh, yeah, I'm not seeing that movie. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I do, uh, to the previous question, I want I, I would actually want Lobo to be part of the DC cinematic universe. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see him fight Superman, sure. fight some of the bigger the bigger guys. Um, but yeah, as far as Alien Predator being in, in the DCU, no, no, not yeah, at all. Yeah, now well, let's just take that sub question, say Alien and Predator, do we ever see a future for them together again? Because it was such a great run as a comic book and maybe even as a video game. Is there a chance that we could get that back into theaters or am I asking for too much for I Christmas? would put Predator and Alien and E.T. in a three-way <laughs> three battle, battle. Uh, chasing after Natasha who's crying in a weird escape pod filled <laughs> with Reese's yes. pieces. I just can't feel like you're you're making fun of me, aren't you? No, not okay, at all. well fine. Then we'll go to live Twitter questions. Ashley, oh, what's right. first up in the Twitter sphere? Okay. Um Jeannie LC writes, Do you think it hurts a rebooted or newly sequeled old franchise when original actors don't return? Um, I, no, I don't think it hurts a new franchise if actors don't return. I think that it really is a case-by-case -case basis. On more than one occasion, you don't want any of the original actors to come back because you're trying to establish a separate universe. Imagine if they tried to reboot the Hulk, but Eric Bana's like, hey, I'm still on board, right? Right. right? You guys like, right? I, I can be in the movie. It's like, no, no, no. We want to separate. I know sometimes it's hard, like, for example, when the Christopher Nolan Batman movies came to the end of their run and Christian Bale, everybody's like, oh, maybe Christian Bale just back up the truck a month he dump it on his front lawn maybe he comes back and is in batman versus superman something like that and it's like no no it's hard to say goodbye to somebody we really loved as a character but then you look at what ben affleck is doing even before the movie comes out as batman and that's pretty exciting too so as long as somebody has the rocks to step up and say look somebody did great work with this character before i i have the confidence i can carry the torch and move it forward in a different direction i think it's the right play to leave the rest of the cast behind dennis what's your take yeah i think it's too confusing especially i mean for everyone that's watching home and us here, I, we, we know enough about movies and read about them. If they actually did that, we would know. We would like, okay, they're rebooting it with the same guy. But most casual movie fans that go will, will wonder, well, if Christian Bale is here as Batman again, then obviously this is the same universe that we had before. So I think I think for that fact, you just can't do it. And look at the way the fans revolted just to the opening of that Ghostbusters trailer when it said, you know, 30 years ago they saved the city. And we're like, it's not the same universe. <laughs> right. What are you talking about? Right. You know, now it's going to be confusing enough to see Bill Murray just be like a pizza shop guy mm -hmm. in that movie without them saying, oh, yeah, 30 years ago this happened. But don't worry, we're retconning all that stuff. Yeah. So, Schnapp, are you in agreement with Dennis and I? Yes, I am. I think uh, when you do a reboot, I think it's uh, recasting everybody in a brand new universe and you could change things. You don't have to go with whatever the other, you know, single film or trilogy went with. I think that that story has been told and it's always refreshing anew. Like as you keep seeing these films and eventually we're gonna get to the end of the road with X-Men. Obviously you Jackman's got that last Wolverine film. We all want it to be amazing, but we know it ends. So they're gonna have to either get a new Wolverine, chill that character out for a little bit until we want that, we we desperately want that a new Wolverine, which will be like three years from then. So, you know, it's like, it's you gotta give everybody a chance to take their own, their own take on the character you know i think there's a different writer there's a different director there's going to be a different actor and we get those regime changes every three to ten years so. yeah i mean sometimes it's cool because that is the way that that's the that's par for the course right but when mm -hmm. we were talking about wanting to see jk simmons back as jay jonah jameson that's not a main character no. that's just somebody who's got a couple fun scenes i really like that short that they did the dirty laundry short with the punisher sure. with thomas jane back as the punisher it just it doesn't seem like that that's the way that that should be the norm that could be the the weird outlier where it's like, oh, yeah, it's occasionally nice to see that, but we think a proper reboot should have new people. Totally. What's next? Chad Joyce writes, best use of an F-bomb in a PG-13 movie. For me, it's Armageddon. Uh, for Armageddon, yeah, that was that actually was a good F-bomb. For me, it's first X-Men First Class, yeah, Wolverine. That, that one's a Bam. great one. That's a great one, yeah. I mean, so like, if you're a PG-13 movie, I'm not sure what the MPA, what the strict guideline is. I think it's one F-bomb. It's just one F-bomb? Yep. And then if you get two, you're R-rated. All right. I want to say that there must have been an F-bomb somewhere that was expertly used in Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead. I just can't <laughs> think of what it would be off the top of my head. It's probably said by Kenny. I just don't know when it would have happened. Dennis, do any F-bomb 
bombs that are in PG-13 movies strike you? Uh, I mean, the first class one, and especially because they called back to it again in, in uh, X-Men totally. Days of Future I was going to tell you what you told oh, me. Exactly. Yeah, it's so great. It was a great callback when uh, Professor X told Wolverine to F off, you know? <laughs> that was pretty sweet. There was also a great F-bomb dropped on this show last week by John Schnapp. I know you've been <laughs> dropping some F-bombs here right. and there a little more liberally than maybe you used sure. to, but when you just said, fuck it, next topic, <laughs> <laughs> just one of the all-time Collider movie yeah. talk moments. I just couldn't rag on cl- uh, the flatliners anymore. I was just like, I'm done. Case closed. <laughs> fuck just, it. Yeah. Just clock out. I'll go see I'm Hardcore out. Henry yeah. again. Flipping a table. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what do we got next? 21 Pucks, JJ Jomar, 21, writes, what movie character would someone describe you as? Oh, God. Okay, I'm going to try to step out <laughs> of uh, the club, if you That's will. Right. You I'm mean gonna, the Conja Club? Yes, I'm going to try to step out of that uh, dance club. I'm going to try to step out of, like, you know, Take Me Home Tonight or Win a Date with Tad Hamilton, something that Topher Grace <laughs> was in. I don't know if the dude from Walking Dead has been in feature films yet. So I'm going to try to take a step back from that. And if you could describe me as a character, I think in my youth, you would have been pretty accurate if you did either Bill and or Ted from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Nice. Because they, they did what I always did did in school where I didn't I didn't never got the time travel necessarily but I always just like to goof off instead of paying attention until right at the end when I was about to fail a class then you have to have some like marvelous presentation just to get the D that's what I did especially in my college career once I realized that I'm not going to be a doctor and that was pretty early on I was like all I need to do is get D's and nobody can say anything about it sweet 1.1 grade point average here I come and look at where I'm sitting now I get to host movie talk god the world works in mysterious serious ways kids. John what about you well I was gonna say I'm gonna write a very special biodome six I don't care how many <laughs> ones didn't happen we're just gonna go right jump into six I'm locking you in with a couple other those schlubs from comedy store we're gonna just make a really fun film gonna shoot it in a weekend okay but um, is this a proper reboot or do, can we have Paulie Shore make a cameo maybe he's gonna I, be the Dutch yeah, in this movie we can maybe throw him in from an alternate universe a separate biodome there's a rip in the biodome uh, <laughs> space-time continuum myself Phil six six symbols phil jimble jamble uh 77 six six um myself i would see myself perhaps um as some kind of a bizarre uh conglomerate uh version of maybe uh uh you know jack black meets pen meets uh yeah. flounder meets john belushi in a in a bizarre egg scramble vacuum form side universe so that's i'd be crawling out of there like hey what's up kids Whoa! And then, then explode. Maybe I'm a giant. I'm ego, the living planet. I don't know what I would be. You really put a lot of characters in the Vitamix. Right I know. There, I just blended all that, became a giant planet. <laughs> and Dennis, <laughs> do you, do you maybe have one or two characters that you're like? Uh, I would probably be like an Asian version of Larry David from Curb Your Enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> like all the stuff that happens to him, I, I get like that stuff happens to me, and I think the same things that he does. And then you just don't actually say it. You're like, you got all these things. You're like, well, you actually should be saying this, or you should do this, or do that. And then you just keep quiet. And you know what's great about the crew that we have behind the scenes is that they always remind me of Wayne and Garth's buddies from Wayne's World. Now they're just like, they're just the guys that are hanging around. And they're like, they're, they're, the, one, they're the reason why they're on the cable access show. So guys, when Rob Lowe comes in and has that meeting with us, just make sure you make a good impression because he might make you out of a job soon. I just want to let you know. Ashley, have you ever been watching a movie and been like, oh my God, um, I'm finally on Well, camera. the picture behind Dennis, just Deadpool. I'm Deadpool. I literally think that I'm Deadpool. He he loves Hello Kitty. He loves to curse. He loves sexual jokes. Like, that's just me in a nutshell. He is your spirit that's animal. Right. He is. All right. Let's take a few more. All right. Jonathan Peck writes, Jim Carrey's last film was two years ago, and he has no films coming out. Can he make a comeback? Um, I think Jim Carrey can continue to be a force to be reckoned with in movies, but it, for Jim Carrey to make a comeback, that would mean he has to be the biggest comedy star on the planet and indeed the entire universe again. And I just don't see that scenario happening. I mean, you have your heyday in movies like Ace Ventura and Dumb and Dumber and The Mask and Liar Liar, and he, it was a force unlike anything we'd ever seen in comedy, maybe since Eddie Murphy, and I don't know that we've seen anything like that since the comet known as Jim Carrey landed in the mid 90s from in living color so for him to make that kind of comeback it's virtually impossible but what Jim Carrey can do and what I hope he does is that he can be funny in movies but if you go towards more serious dramatic roles I would love to see him do that and be that perennial Oscar contender that we all thought he was and maybe he got snubbed a couple times if you look at his performances in like Man on the Moon or Eternal Sunshine mm-hmm. of the Spotless Mind even like Yes Man something like that well maybe not Yes Man it's nice to see him in movies because I think he is such a talented dude 
dude. And you get the bonus of if he's in good movies and he gets to show up at these award shows, he's the funniest presenter yeah. of the night, hands down. Uh, I'd like to see him make a comeback, but like you said, it's not going to rival what he's already done. And also, you have to think about comedy trends, you know? Like, his style of comedy is not exactly what what's in right now and i would like to see him do some more dramatic roles because i loved him in eternal sunshine of the spotless mind mm -hmm. he was great in the truman show so right, that right. type of angle and also most recently he was pretty funny in um kick-ass 2 i forgot the character's name it was a, yeah uh, yeah captain something so captain yeah. something i thought he was hilarious in that so maybe maybe something along those lines Should i think got a shot i think uh carrie is incredibly he's a genius and it's just the right material i mean if you look at even the cable guy he's fantastic and then that's an underrated comedy i mean that that film is fantastic i think he goes back i don't know if i i don't need to see him in something like eternal sunshine or man on the moon i know he's a great actor he can do that but his just natural talent is to be funny. And I know a lot of com uh, comedians usually want to be, uh, look, I I'm also can be serious. So they're always forcing themselves to be in serious movies because they want to, well, don't laugh at me. Or there's some weird thing in the back of their head where like, just be funny, man. You're naturally funny. Be fucking funny. You know, it's like you don't need to be. There's enough serious actors out there who could never be funny. You have it naturally. And now you're trying to be something you're not. So a lot of, a lot of people are always fighting against just what's natural to them. And I feel like, I'm not going to say that's Jim Carrey, but he's, you know, constantly pining to be into to be taken seriously. He was in that weird number 23. Look, I'm crazy, you know, or whatever. <laughs> it's like, look, dude, you're fucking funny. I, I think he's one of the, the funniest guys on the planet. Eddie Murphy. The, certain people are just inherently funny and they're fight. They fight against it all the time because they don't want to be laughed at. And it's like, look, no one's laughing at you. or We're laughing with you. Yeah, you didn't. You haven't gotten that yet. So I just I always I'm waiting for all those amazing comedians to just get get it get there what they're naturally funny at it and get it on the screen so i mean i think he's he's ripe for i don't even think it would be called a comeback he's already been there it's like when people are there i don't ever feel, feel it's a comeback it's just like oh they got their thing again Damn. and he may not necessarily ever want to go back to that to the eye of the storm when it was that big and intense sure. you know and you're right so many comics want to be just to, just to be taken seriously not this dipshit you laugh and i clock out <laughs> jim carrey is the executive producer of an upcoming show i believe it's on either hbo or showtime called I'm dying up here, and it's based on the novel that is about the early days of stand-up comedy in Los Angeles. I'm not sure if he's going to have a role in it, but there's a lot of comics that you're going to see in that movie that are hysterical. It's actually a TV show, I think, so keep your eyes open for I'm dying up here based on the novel. Ashley, let's do one more Twitter question. Oh, okay. Well, Sebastian Filo writes, have you ever thought of adding subtitles on your videos? Dennis, this is probably for you. Subtitles for our videos? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I, I don't think we have the infrastructure to do that. Uh, if you're talking about like English subtitles, I think uh, YouTube already has like some sort of closed captioning where it, it takes the voices and translates the best that it can. But in terms of subtitles for other languages yeah we just don't have the resources for that yeah it would be kind of cool to have like a court sonographer just sit off to the side and oh, just try to dope. they would hate me like i talk really fast i'm sorry i talk so fast they would literally <laughs> loathe me every time that i'm on this plus show. let's challenge the stupid google computer translate this mofo scramble scramble bagibu egg <laughs> scramble flip flop -bing -bong. Uh -huh. scramble gabba 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 floop joint <laughs> that actually was that last kid's twitter handle so that was <laughs> you pretty long nailed yeah. it that that is all the time that we have here on Yo Gabba Gabba Movie Talk. Uh, my name is Mark, and we want to remind you guys that in a couple weeks, we have the movie trivia schmodown. Look at the first matchup. We're going to have the same day that Batman versus Superman is in theaters on the 25th. Look at these two titans going against each other. John La Cosa Nostra Campia versus Dangerous Dan Murrow of Screen Junkies fame. They're going to be going at it right here at Collider Studios, and you're going to be able to check that out on the Collider YouTube channel. March 25th. We are so excited to bring not just that, but a bunch of great matchups coming up very soon to your computers. Maybe or maybe not in closed caption. I want to thank everybody up here who joined me at the table as well as everybody in the back. We got Adam, we got Jonathan, we got Wendy, we got Riley over there. Thank you guys. And thank you to Dennis Zang. Where can the kids find you? Well, before that, I want to talk about WonderCon. We're going to be there at WonderCon. You know, we're gonna, yeah. I think we're going to shoot a movie talk from there and then we're also going to be doing a lot of interviews and videos. But uh, Schnepp has a panel here 
Heroes panel uh, Saturday night. What was it? 7:30 uh, in room 152. Be yeah. there, and then right after that, we're having a party. We're right? gonna have a, not a party, a meetup. A party well, a meet up. that we're Sorry. gonna yeah yeah yep. that we're gonna like cater something. <laughs> a meetup. Yeah. yeah, that was the Jack Black asking Larry <laughs> David if right. we can have some friends over. Exactly. Yeah. Now you see our character. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, we'll have a meetup. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Think Hero on Instagram Dennis TZNG. We'll announce the meetup in one Periscope. Then you just have to try to ping it and find out <laughs> where the hell it is. Schnapp, where can the kids find you? Uh, you can do a walk and talk and find me uh, at uh, <laughs> at John Schnapp on Twitter and Instagram. Today is another hero, so tune in for that. And uh, you can check out my Kickstarter. It's called Sweaties Unite, Rise of the Uber Nerd. It's all about comic book culture. Check it out. Help donate. I'll see you guys later. And our very own Unmasked Deadpool. Ashley Mova, where can they find you? You guys can find me on Twitter and on Instagram at Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, guys. And make sure you guys follow Collider.com. You can go there right now, check out a bunch of cool news stories, subscribe to this YouTube channel, Collider Video, and check out our friends at AMC Theaters, amctheaters.com, for all the latest showtime and ticket information. Uh, and lastly but not least, Schmoes No, the live show Phase 6, is coming back right here in this studio on the Schmoes No YouTube channel. Christian and I and the whole crew are going to be back. We are so excited to launch Phase 6. It's the most fun you can have with your clothes on. But actually, now that I think about it, you can just watch it naked if you really care to. <laughs> 7 to 9 p.m. PST is when it kicks off live Thursday night. My name is Mark Ellis. You can follow me on all the social media networks at Mark Ellis Live. That's all for us, and we'll see you guys tomorrow. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.